Hey, hey, everyone. Sleepy Reader here, Damien, with my Wednesday haul, plus a bunch of other stuff, because I realized I have a whole bunch of um, books that I bought in at different bookstores in the past maybe three weeks, and I thought I'd show them to you. Some of them are comic book related. Some are pulpy, pulpy goodness. So first, with the new comics, um, I'm not sure how many I got. Got a bunch of DC and a bunch of independent books. I'm very excited to jump on, jump into uh, Green Lantern number three. I enjoyed the first two issues. They weren't super Grant Morrison-y, but they had an odd quirkiness and amazing art. I especially loved, uh, I mean, it's the Liam Sharp art. I especially loved it in issue two for some reason. It really grabbed a hold of me. So, um, yeah, the comic book craving is strong with this comic. Deathstroke Arkham. Um, yeah, I'm still sticking with this book. Uh, enjoying it. Not a lot to say about it. Super Sons, I'm an issue or two behind now. So I've got to shotgun some of these issues of Super Sons. Um, they're definitely, I, I've said it before, they're very much the young kids' comics. Batman Kings of Fear. Uh, this has kind of steadily remained... Mostly like loving the art. Eh, the story's got some pluses and minuses to it. Um, but we don't get uh, Jones, uh, I was going to say Bruce Jones, but uh, Kelly Jones doing Batman that much anymore. And when he does, it's a huge treat for the likes of me anyway. Oops, there's some back issues. Let's go. Then I, um, I bought Die number two. This is not on my pull list. If I was at all intelligent, I'd just wait for the pull, wait for the trade, but I was just in that mood to grab a lot of comics in the shop, so I grabbed Die Number 2. And ironically, I also grabbed Die, Die, Die Number 6. I'm assuming this is a, a short-run comic. Um, in fact, I'm kind of hoping this is the last issue. I have not read any of the issues of this yet, but I love Chris Burnham art, but when I bought the first issue... I opened it up, and there was a bunch of really gross things with people getting their noses cut off and stuff, and I just wasn't in the mood for that. But since it's Chris Burnham, I want to read it eventually. So I've been picking it up all along, um, and this is number six. Uh, maybe I will f get in the mood to get all bloody and shotgun these books and let you know what I think about them. Another one I'm behind on, Wrong Earth. I am I think I'm just one issue behind on this, but... Um, it's a lot of fun and uh, kind of Batman related, so that's cool. Looks kind of like a um, Two-Face character on the cover there. Self-Made, I talked about this in my recent Comic Book Thoughts video. Um, it had a lot of cool aspects and a lot, uh, and seemed like it could have been structured a little better writing-wise. Um, but I'm very curious to see what they'll do with it in issue number two. That cover is pretty awesome. Especially the, just the way the, the colorist has handled all those different greens. Uh, really pops for me. Speaking of great color, Oblivion Song keeps chugging along. I can't... This feels like it comes out more than once a month. But anyway, it comes out with great regularity. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a, a strong story um, and good storytelling from the art. I'm not a big fan of the art style, but I'm a huge fan of the coloring which seems to sort of balance out aspects of the art style that that are just not too exciting for me. Curse Words, um, they also come out with great regularity. I think Curse Words does take breaks, but um, this continue has continued to be you know just a super fun ride for me. Uh, a fantasy comic, but unique amongst fantasy comics just because of its tone or something. It's like somehow... Mad Magazine got into the mix or something. <laughs> oh, and here's the here's the piece de resistance of the of the week. At least I assume it will be. This is an awesome cover, disturbing cover, um, very intense. Talk about great colors. I assume that uh, Sean Phillips painted this cover. I don't, or or is it digitally painted by his colorist afterwards, who I believe is going to be his son again, Jacob. Jacob Phillips. 
and they have given us an oversized issue for the regular price of three ninety nine. I've been thinking. I, I was listening to a podcast with a um, interviewing a comic shop owner, and they were the interviewer was telling the comic shop owner how wonderful he was for giving ten percent off of, off to his pull list customers. Um, I don't know if they actually give ten percent more than ten percent off to people who get a lot of comics, but. At my shop, I get enough comics that I get 25% off. And that really encourages me to keep buying comics. I mean, the if I paid full price for comics or even 10% off, I'd be buying a lot less. It's partially economics and partially psychological. Uh, it's painful. The more you pay for a comic, if it turns out not to be good, the more painful that seems. Um, anyway, kudo, kudos to uh, the Brewbaker and Phillips team for um, doing us doing us a good one with the price there with the, va the you know it looks feels like it feels just about twice as thick as this is your birthright which always gives good value for the price too um, in fact birthright was one of the longest holdouts I think at the 299 level which uh, which I really appreciated <laughs> for a long time I was telling myself, you know, with my discounts, I used to get a lesser discount at another store, but I, I for a two ninety nine comic, I was paying about two fifty, and I thought, well, that, that's my value point. That two fifty is about what a comic book is worth to me. Now there are no comic books I can get for that, um, but so I'm paying three dollars a comic book, and that's you know near the edge. If if I had to pay anyway, as I was saying, if I had to pay full price, there would not be this stack of comics pulled all in one week and as is my usual want if I have time I go to the the newly processed back issue box that he has right on the counter and I found some Thors that I want and so I got uh, also get 25% off everything in the shop so um, I'm a little worried with this issue being six dollars if there's something wrong with it in there, so I must have paid what, like four fifty or something for this. Um, this one will probably be in better shape. Love that John Buscema cover. I was a bit surprised my CLZ app said I didn't have this issue already, so I just sna snapped it up. So that that's Thor one seventy six through one seventy seven, and then so I'll be curious to see. Oh, one se sorry. One through 178, so I showed them in the wrong order. Is this going to be the first issue John Buscema draws? I'm not sure. Um, be interesting to check it out. And then finally, new at the shop was this volume two of Michael Cray. I haven't read my volume one yet. It's more the completest in me because I was getting the Wildstorm book written by Warren Ellis, which I was enjoying a lot. Uh, I've been collecting it in trade, so I wanted to get its companion book, Michael Cray, in trades. I haven't heard, uh, when it first came out, I heard people kind of complaining about it, and then I haven't really heard people talking about it at all. kind of wonder if the whole Wildstorm thing, the revival of Wildstorm, is about to go away, um, just because I'm not hearing much buzz about it. So, uh, and DC's on to all the new things that they're doing. Um, but I, I certainly hope they get to finish their stories. So that's all the stuff I purchased today. I started noticing some small bookstores, small used bookstores popping up in my neighborhood. Um, uh, right around just after Christmas, I went to a new one a few blocks away from my house. And yesterday, after having lunch with a friend I, on Belmont Street, I noticed a tiny little shop um, next to the restaurant we were eating in and I went in after lunch and it was a very nice tiny used bookstore and I got American Born Chinese by Jean Luen Yang which I guess is a young adult comic or a kids comic um, and it won some kind of award I can't even tell with this shiny thing I don't know it's hard to read it American Library Association, some kind of award from the American Library Association. But I think it's because of this book and maybe a few others that he is 
is he like the Library of Congress graphic novelist or something like that? Anyway, um, it was in very good shape, good, pretty good price. So I grabbed it. Um, and at the same shop, I got this book called Comics Art uh, by someone named Paul Gravitt. I, this cover is almost irresistible by, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Juiced. This uh, artist who basically cops Tintin's art style, but was part of the, um, to me, part of the group of artists that I discovered in Raw magazine. <clears throat> I'm not sure if he's European or just has a very European sounding name. So this looks like it may be a book that's kind of trying to define what comics are all about and how they work. Um, reading the first few pages, uh, to me, it was like the writing of one of those college professors who isn't actually a very good writer, but knows how to do all the, uh, get the whole academic style going. So he sounds somehow like he's intelligent, even though his ideas are not coming across very well. But it's a, it's a beautiful volume. I'll probably keep plugging away at it, um, there's a whole chapter on autobiographical comics. And the, in the introduction, as I was reading, you know, they're talking about fantasies that what if Pablo Picasso did comics? What if Salvador Dali did? Kind of the idea that comics really should be in the fine art realm and, and in an alternate universe, uh, they already would be discovered by fine artists and not, not all these pulp uh, commercial artists that that dominate our, our comics. Um, and sort of the idea that that's the direction it's headed in. I'm not sure if I'm happy about that, but I'll have to read more of, the, more of this. Um, but I couldn't resist buying it. And it was interesting because on Twitter, there was a discussion about, well, not a full-blown discussion, but a little bit of discussion about Scott McCloud's making comics. And uh, Matt uh, Wednesday Serial said, well, the problem is it's the only book out there that defines what comics are. I think there are more books out there that do that, but they're mostly academic like this. Um, this one was published by Yale University Press. So if it wasn't this really nice package, I'm sure I wouldn't have picked it up because it's just some dry academic kind of treatise. -y. Or perhaps I would have picked it up anyway. And then... Um, Shortly after Christmas, I went with my brother-in-law um, and some other members of the family to Powell's Bookstore, which I, the big one downtown, which I kind of avoid these days. And, uh, and it was super crowded, but, but still, since he was going to browse for a long time, I browsed, and I ended up grabbing myself a number of um, things that I just like the pulpy cover, basically. Uh, Invaders from Rigel by Fletcher Pratt who was once a well-known author. You've probably never heard of him. Uh, Paul Anderson still has a bit of a rep in science fiction, I believe. Um, so some of you may have heard of him. Poole Anderson. I'm sorry, not Paul. Poole Anderson. The Night Face. I've never heard of this particular novel. But I'm always up for more Poole Anderson, actually. He's a good writer. Um, plus, I liked, I liked the cover. Now, this was in their rack of stuff that you're supposed to just buy for the cover. Um, which is interesting. It's more fun to, f I actually mostly found the ones in the stacks mixed in with the other books. The stuff in Buy for the Cover was actually pretty sloppily put together, but I really liked this cover. And the title of this story, uh, Take a Number by Amanda Peretta. So maybe I'll try reading that sometime. It's vivacious, full-bodied, and heavily spiced. And when I find a flip book that I don't already have, um, one of these ace doubles, I always grab that. I believe I don't have this one. I don't have like the equivalent of a CLZ app to keep track of these things. Chariots of Ra by Kenneth Balmer. He was kind of a minor player in science fiction at some point. And Earth Strings by John Rackham, who was also kind of a, a known but minor writer probably the 60s and 70s or 50s and 60s. <clears throat> Excuse me. Although I'm almost wondering if John Rackham is a pseudonym for someone else. Can't remember. Oh, and another flip book. 
uh, Robert Lorry. I've never even heard of him. That could be a pseudonym for someone, I guess. A Harvest of Hoodwinks by Robert Lorry. Quite a cool cover, I thought. And it's flip side. I'm going to have to work on getting that sticker off. Masters of the Lamp. Send a spy to find a god. That sounds cool. Oh, the author's name is obscured here. Um, also Robert Lorry. Hmm. I want, I'm going to look up Robert Lorry and see if that's actually a pseudonym for someone more well-known. This is a classic 60s-looking type of science fiction cover to me. <clears throat> and then I couldn't resist this by an author I've never heard of also, The Cosmozoids, because of the title. I like the cover too, but I like the title. When is a man not a man? When his body and mind have been invaded by the Cosmozoids. And finally, uh, well, finally on that trip, <laughs> I picked up Blade, Champion of the Gods. Um, this is number 21 in the Blade series. And, the, and Blade supposedly was written by this guy, Jeffrey Lord, but it was actually like three or four authors, including Andrew Offit and some others, who I can't remember right now. This, I love this uh, Ken, what's his name? Ken... Ken Kelly cover. He's done a lot of Conan covers, too. He's kind of a, a pseudo Frazetta guy. I also wonder, as I looked at this cover, if this was a regular barbarian type of cover, and then he ha uh, tacked on this face there. Um, so maybe it's a reused painting. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. Blade is Richard Blade, a secret agent, kind of like a cross between uh, James Bond and Conan. They project his body into other dimensions in every every episode, uh, but he works for the MI5 or whatever, MI13, some British secret agency, um, and goes to other dimensions and gets involved in fantasy situations and has sex with willing women and uh, proves how macho he is uh, by beating everyone up. But... Um, I, so I've read some of it, and I was surprised actually at how well written it was. It's very well written, but it's not deeply imagined. It's it's pretty lazy in the 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 exotic desert world that he ends up in. Uh, not a lot of efforts put into that, and not a lot of effort is put into the motivation for people to have sex with him. Um, but I may keep reading it. It's kind of good just read a few pages before you go to bed type of book. Um, yeah, I read a number of these as a kid, and probably it was the sex scenes that I shouldn't have been reading that made it particularly interesting. <clears throat> oh, you know what? While we're at it, um, from eBay, I ordered some Conan paperbacks that had never been read. But the interesting thing is, and you can see the spine hasn't been cracked or anything, but they're not in very good shape. And they didn't cost me very much money. Um, but it's interesting that even books that have never been read uh, just kind of deteriorate over time. And I think maybe wherever they were stored, other books were rubbing against them and the ink rubs off even off the covers. So these are all Frank Frazetta covers. Um, this is the kind of, this is the, era of Conan books that introduced me to Conan, along with some Barry Smith um, Conan from Marvel Comics. Um, so there we have, uh, it's too bad there's all these words over this incredible painting here, but anyway. Uh, so that was Conan the Avenger, which I think is Conan after he became a king, off to rescue his queen who's been kidnapped by an evil sorcerer. And then Conan the Adventurer, which I think is a bunch, I might be wrong about, maybe it's a different, uh, it's been so long, so I'm looking forward to rereading these, although I'm a little afraid about cracking the spine, but uh, I think Conan the Adventurer will just be a series of stories, uh, yeah, People of the Black Circle, The Slithering Shadow, Drums of Tombolku, and The Pool of the Black One, so that, that should have a lot of stuff that's actually written by Robert E. Howard in there, um, Conan the Usurper, 
So these are the stories leading up to when he first takes over the kingdom of Aquilonia. Um, loved all of these uh, Frazetta covers, but I always found this one particularly creepy and powerful. And kind of crazy, how the snake get between the guy's legs. <laughs> and what does that symbolize? This one has uh, the treasure of Tyrannicos, wolves beyond the border, the phoenix on the sword, and the scarlet citadel. Um, all of those names and the ones I read in here reverberate with me with as great, powerful, amazing stories. Um, of course, I read them when I was 11, 12, 13. So when I reread them, we'll see how that goes. And Conan the Warrior. Um, it's always Conan the. This one has the famous Red Nails, Jewels of Galwar, and Beyond the Black River. River. So just three novellas. Um, I can remember Beyond the Black River pretty well. It's almost like a story as... Uh, a frontier story where the Indians are attacking a fortress and uh, the main characters are not Conan. Conan appears as their rescuer every now and then, if I remember correctly. Okay, and another thing I bought at Powell's was this, um, this book called Frank Reed, Adventures in the Age of Invention. And this is sort of a pre-pulp um, Although I guess it counts as pulp, but I don't think they were called pulps back in, well, this one's 1902, quite so far back then. But they were these cheap magazines which, um, which included science fiction adventures in them long before it was called science fiction or even scientific fiction. It might have been called scientific romances. But I think it, uh, it has like robots in the Wild West and things like that. Let's see, what are the... I don't see the dates. And so I think this guy, Frank Reed, is a fictional young adventurer, a uh, young inventor who goes off on adventures. But I'm going to have to read more about this. I vaguely was aware of, of books like this in the, or, you know, magazines like this in the history of science fiction. And I think it includes the... Uh, the Steam Man of the Prairies, which I think is a, a famous proto-science fiction story. Is that what this is? Yep. Uh, oh, so Frank Jr.'s father, Frank Sr., invented this Steam Man. Did you ever... There was this... Um, oh, what was it called? There was this Steam Man robot in, in a, a comic that was... You know, Neil Gaiman's something, Mr. Steam Man or something, uh, but not written by Neil Gaiman back in the 90s. And finally, I got this book called Harvey Horrors, Collected Works, Witches' Tales, Volume 3. It was remaindered. It has a forward by Joe Lansdale, which gave me a little more confidence that it might be fun to read. And so it's, um, is it a yo book? No, it's a PS book, but it's one of these things with uh, not the best scans in the world of original comics that are out of copyright. Um, so normally I don't want to pay full price for that, but, but with at the cheap remainder price, I thought I'd dip into this and see how I enjoy it. Um, I don't know if Harvey, if the Harvey Horror line was considered a good one or just something cheesy and fun. I think somebody does still own the copyright to Harvey Comics, but maybe maybe they let go this line of horror. Because <clears throat> I don't think you could do the same with uh, Richie Rich and Little Dot and all of those characters. Oh, there's me in my youth. Quite a slender waist, but wider hips that I had. So yeah, I'll, I'll let you know when I, when I read that. Okay, but first I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get down to Criminal and then probably Green Lantern. Talk to you all later. Bye-bye.